we've seen that uh, households are going to do two main things uh, in our model of Slack. They are going to consume services and they are going to produce services. Here, I want to focus on the production side of things. So we want to build a model of the business cycle. Um, and we have households who are going to produce services. And so um, we need to decide a little bit um, as producers, what is exactly the problem that the household will face? What are the things that they can choose and what are the things that they cannot choose to? Uh, and what we have to keep in mind is that we want to represent well the business cycle. So if you're a producer of services, um, the first thing that we could think is that maybe um, the households can adjust their capital um, over time um, to respond to a business cycle fluctuation. So here, of course, it's a static model, but if that was the case, if um, the capital stock moved a lot over the business cycle, um, then we would allow um, households to choose um, their capital stock in the model. And then in response to shocks, when we do comparative statics, the capital stock would be able um, to vary. Um, and so because we want to have a model that represents uh, well the real world, here we have an empirical question, which is, uh, how much does the capital stock vary over time and in particular over the business cycle? Um, and thanks to the FRED database, that's a question that's fairly easy to, to answer. Um, so what we want to uh, figure out is how much does the capital stock vary over uh, the business cycle. Right, so um, what I pulled up from Fred is a capital stock in the US at constant uh, prices. You know, I, I, this is clean from inflation. Um, we don't want to take into account changes in prices. We just want to see what the real capital stock does. Okay, and so, um, so this is uh, what we have. Um, so again, this goes uh, from the 50s to today. You have the recessions. And the main thing that you can see is that, of course, the capital stock is growing over time. But the main, you know, what I want you to take away from this graph is that the growth of the capital stock is extremely smooth. Um, and you can see that there is essentially no response of the capital stock to recessions. Uh, it's just a very, very smooth uh, growth. The capital stock is unaffected uh, by recessions. Um, and so, so essentially, um, is unaffected by the business cycle. You can see due to the smoothness of the growth, and um, and it's you know this is not uh, really a, uh, this is not really a new finding. If you go back to um, Cooley and Prescott's first chapter in um, Frontiers of Business Cycle Research, you know the main textbook uh, for business cycle research. When they list, um, they list features of the data the, that, um, you know, features of business cycle uh, data in the US. And uh, their finding number five is that the capital stock fluctuates much less than output and is largely uncorrelated with output. And of course, output varies um, over the business cycle, uh, but that's not the case of the capital stock. So it fluctuates much less and is uncorrelated. Um, and so here, this is just what we see. Uh, that's just what we see in this data. Um, so in our model, what we'll assume essentially is that the capital stock is constant. And um, although that's not the assumption that the, that the uh, RBC model makes because they want to study both business cycles and uh, long-term growth. It's an assumption that's very common in business cycle model and an assumption that's well justified because as we can see, capital, the capital stock doesn't really respond to business cycle. So 
We have a household that want to produce services. Uh, we've seen that the capital stock, that's something that doesn't really respond to business cycles, so we take it as fixed. Or one thing that you could say is what about um, technology, you know, how, the, how productive the capital stock can be. Uh, but of course, technology is something that moves even more slowly than the capital stock. Technology, in a sense, is a blueprint to build capital goods, or it's a blueprint for the effectiveness of capital goods. And so if the amount of capital goods move very slowly, you can imagine that the blueprint for this capital good is even going to move much more slowly than that. So there's no doubt that if capital moves slowly, technology is going to move even more slowly, right? Uh, you know, in a sense, like if we think about a restaurant, it's clearly easier to buy an additional microwave oven or an additional stove than design a new technology for the microwave or, uh, or the stove. Um, so clearly, you know, technology is something that will take us uh, completely fixed uh, here, just because obviously it's going to uh, it's going to be fixed over the business cycle. That's just um, obvious. I don't have data for technology because measuring productivity is very difficult. And usually when you see fluctuation in productivity over the business cycle, it's because technology, because productivity or technology is mismeasured and actually captures fluctuations in Slack. So um, we don't want to look at that, but it's obvious that it's something that's more slow moving than capital. Um, so we have technology that's going to be, of course, we'll keep it constant in the background. Capital that's going to be constant. Now, another question is what about um, labor? What about the labor supply? Um, you know, we could imagine that, all, you know, if we think of one household having a restaurant, okay, they have a fixed number of tables, they have a fixed kitchen equipment that gives them a certain productivity, but you could imagine that they change the number of people uh, from the family that uh, work in the restaurant over time or that, uh, you know, and so that the workforce of the restaurants is going to, uh, is going to vary um, over time. Uh, and that's a choice that they make over the business cycle. And sometimes they have more people and sometimes they have uh, fewer people that want to work in the household. Um, but here again, um, that doesn't seem to be uh, the case. Um, so the second question, oh, I should. Um, the second question that I want uh, to ask is how much does labor supply, basically the amount of uh, hours of labor that um, households want to um, supply to the market, how much does labor supply vary over the business cycle? Uh, and here I don't want to look at actual hours work or actual employment because that captures not only how much the household want to work, but also say in the real world, like how many hours of firms uh, use them, how many workers a firm decide to employ. Uh, so here there is already, uh, this is already going to be based on the demand for uh, for labor services. But here, because we have a, you know, simple model with only one market, what I'm on, you know, how much demand there is that would be part of the model. But I want to, the question I'm asking here is just uh, whether the, how, the amount of labor that supply is something that's going to vary a lot over the cycle. And if that's the case, that's something we want to model. We want to understand how, how households are going to decide how much labor to supply. If it's very stable over time, the amount of labor that supplies, and you know, we don't really need to model it, we can take it as fixed. Um, so what we want to look at is uh, the labor force participation rate, because this is telling us the share of um, the, the civilian population that wants to work and is looking for a job. So this is really the main uh, labor supply decision that people do. So once you have a job, you don't really decide how many hours you work. You know, that's essentially fixed by contract and then possibly decided by your employer if they want you to work overtime or they decide to put you on furlough. Um, the number of people, you know, um, who work in a household, given that they are part of the labor force, that's also outside of their control, it depends on how many people are able to find a job given labor market condition. But what's 
in people's control is whether they participate or not in the labor force. That's really the main decision that people make in the real world. Like, do I want to participate in the labor force or not? Um, and so I want to know whether this varies uh, a lot over the cycle. Um, and it turns out that it doesn't actually. Um, so this is the labor force participation rate uh, in the US. This is computed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In fact, it comes out of the CPS, just like the unemployment rate. Um, and so uh, there are a couple of stylized facts that you can see. So initially, you can see all the way to the 70s. That was fairly stable here. And um, you do see that you have some small fluctuations in labor force participation, but you know they are tiny. We're talking at most uh, one percentage point, and they don't really seem correlated with the business cycle. Then you see that you have a big increase in participation all the way to the mid-90s. And that in the background, what we know what's going on here, uh, this is that women are entering the labor force in large numbers. Um, but again, you know, so you have this big kind of medium run increase, but you don't really see fluctuations that are driven by business cycles here. You know, there's a little bit of movement, but they don't, there is no clear uh, cyclicality. Then you see kind of a plateau in uh, participation. Uh, and, you know, just for about five to 10 years. And then after that, since 2000, you see kind of a secular decline in participation. Uh, and, but, you know, this secular decline, you know, it doesn't seem, you know, so um, it doesn't really seem driven by the business cycle. So people say, oh, there was a big decline in the great, uh, in the great recession that we have here. Um, but what you see is that, you know, actually participation was fairly constant. And then after that, it just uh, dropped at the end of the Great Recession and it kept on uh, kind of dropping until 2016 or 17, where it kind of plateaued. Uh, so this doesn't seem, you know, driven uh, at all by uh, the Great Recession. And in fact, the decline in participation had started much before. It really uh, kicked off in 2000. And if we opened up a little bit, so data and we separate and we looked at what men do and women do, we would see that we would understand what's going on. Essentially, women entered the labor force all the way to 2000 and after that participation by women remained fairly stable, whereas uh, the participation rate for men has been declining since the 50s. And so it's this decline in participation for men, which started you know, more than half a century ago, that's driving this decline in participation uh, since 2000. Uh, because Earlier, you don't see it because it's hidden uh, by the entry in the labor force by women. But once women stop entering in the labor force and men keep dropping out, uh, the participation rate has been dropping. But all of these are really uh, medium run forces um, that are driving this result. And it's clearly not, you know, it doesn't have much to, to do with the business cycle. Um, and, you know, the only recession that led to a really big uh, change in participation, of course, is the COVID recession that we have here. Here you can see that, of course, when COVID happened, there was a massive drop in participation uh, by two percentage points, which is very rare, something we had never seen before. Um, but that's, of course, because it became much more dangerous to work. And so, you know, people do respond to this type of to working conditions. And if it becomes very dangerous to work, you may expect some people to drop out of the labor force. It's not that surprising. Uh, but it's, you know, it's not something that we typically see. Uh, you don't see any of these big drops before any recessions. Uh, and in fact, another way to see that labor force participation is very, you know, in a, is a cyclical, doesn't respond to the business cycle, is if we look at the same data, but we try to remove demographic uh, forces. So here, you know, labor force participation, can capture you know, the fact that uh, people stay longer in school, you know, which tend to reduce participation. You may have some effects if people decide to retire earlier, retire later, all these demo, you may have effects if the shape of the population pyramid changes. So all these demographic changes uh, contaminate the labor force participation rate. And they are not things that we are particularly interested in for this business cycle uh, model. So what we can do is take participation and focus on the uh, 
group of the population between 25 and 54. So we keep fix the edge window at which we are looking at. Uh, so here, what you know, what what we, it looks like is that labor supply is fairly acyclical, but this is going to be even more uh, even more striking if we focus now on the participation rate for uh, the age group 25 to 54, and we do that to uh, clean out demographic forces. like retirement or the time spent in school. Um, and here what you can see is that, uh, so this is the participation rate once we focus on the 25 to 54, and you can see it's extremely, uh, you know, it's moving very, very slowly, you know, almost as slowly as a picture for the capital stock. Um, so now you can see you have even less response to the business cycle. So what we learned from that, that business cycle may induce people to retire a little bit early, or you know, stay in school a little bit longer. So you may have uh, at the margin some effect, but once you keep the age group constant, then you really see that the uh, participation is completely acyclical. The only time when a recession uh, affected participation again is COVID here, uh, but the effect is, is very very small. Uh, was about one uh, one percentage point. Uh, so what we learn from that is that um, labor supply. is acyclical. It doesn't, you know, how much people want to work doesn't respond to the business cycle. And so in the model, we're going to assume that the labor supply, uh, how much households want to work, is fixed. So to sum up, We'll have, uh, we'll have a fixed you know, production technology, of course. We'll have a fixed capital stock. We have a fixed labor supply or you know, endowment of labor. And so the, you know, the impact of all of this once you add that up, is that uh, we we'll have a fixed productive household, we we'll have a fixed productive capacity. Because they have certain technologies they operate, capital they operate, the amount of labor that's available to produce services is going to be fixed. So we have a fixed productive capacity. Um, And um, that productive capacity, we're going to denote it with uh, the letter K. So that's going to be fixed, and that's the amount. So the interpretation of that productive, uh, productive capacity is the amount of services that a household uh, can, can produce um, in the time period that we consider in our model. So it's the amount of services that the household can uh, also sell to other household. That's what we'll denote uh, by K.